Watch this. Any state law that prevents a hospital from fulfilling its obligation under EMTALA violates federal law. Which is why the country's top lawyer has his sights set on Idaho's abortion trigger law, filing a lawsuit to stop it one day before the Idaho Supreme Court is set to hear arguments on it. Those arguments, from the state perspective, will be coming from two sets of lawyers. The AG's office and outside counsel representing the legislature will defend the lawsuits from Planned Parenthood. Will it mean more than just more money from Idaho taxpayers? 152 years ago today, Idaho became a hotbed of gold diggers, and two men are credited with kickstarting the surge. But only one lived to tell the tale. His name, though, lives on in the Boise Basin. On the day Roe and Casey were overturned, we promised that the Justice Department would work tirelessly, protect, and advance reproductive freedom. That is what we are doing, and that is what we will continue to do. They started a task force, and in their first public action to show they are doing that, the DOJ filed a lawsuit against the state of Idaho, saying the state's abortion trigger law, which was passed in 2020 and set to go in effect in 23 days, it violates federal law. That law is called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, or EMTALA. Enacted in 1986, it says every hospital getting Medicare funds must give the necessary treatment to stabilize a patient when they arrive in emergency room with any condition that could put their life or their health in serious jeopardy. And that treatment could involve abortion. And that's the catch right there. It's not just life in danger, but the phrase health in serious jeopardy. Idaho's law would make it a criminal offense for doctors to provide the emergency medical treatment that federal law requires. Although the Idaho law provides an exception to prevent the death of a pregnant woman, it includes no exception for cases in which the abortion is necessary to prevent serious jeopardy to the woman's health. So according to Attorney General Garland, if a woman shows up to a hospital suffering from a miscarriage that could lead to a septic infection, or she's bleeding uncontrollably because of it, or she's suffering severe preeclampsia where her blood pressure jumps to dangerous levels, threatening her life and the life of the child, which usually doesn't happen until around 20 weeks of pregnancy, well, the doctors may be forced to deny that woman medical treatment because of Idaho's abortion ban. The federal law says her life doesn't have to be in danger, though. Her health just has to be. And because of the supremacy clause, that's the part of the Constitution that says federal law supersedes state law, well, Idaho's law would violate that. The law thus places medical professionals in an impossible situation. They must either withhold stabilizing treatment required by EMTALA or risk felony prosecution and license revocation. In so doing, the law will chill providers' willingness to perform abortions in emergency situations and will hurt patients by blocking access to medically necessary health care. So the Justice Department wants the Ninth Circuit Court to declare Idaho's law violating the Supremacy Clause, making it unconstitutional, and they want an injunction to stop Idaho from enforcing it against health care providers who give that emergency treatment. Garland was asked two questions about this lawsuit today. The first, why is Idaho the first to face such a litigation? Well, his answer was pretty simple. He said Idaho's law seems to be on its face to be in direct conflict with EMTALA and, well, because it hasn't yet gone into effect. But it's about to. And the other question he was asked, doesn't this lawsuit seem to circumvent the Supreme Court and its recent ruling on Roe and Casey? EMTALA is a decision made by the Congress of the United States. The Supremacy Clause is a decision made in the Constitution of the United States. Federal law invalidates state laws that are in direct contradiction. This has really nothing to do with anything that the Supreme Court said and certainly nothing to do with going around the Supreme Court. Okay, so all that being said, what does Idaho have to say about it? Well, plenty. Governor Brad Little, who signed Senate Bill 1385 into law on March 24, 2020, said this, Our nation's highest court returned the issue of abortion to the states to regulate. End of story. The U.S. Justice Department's interference with Idaho's pro-life law is another example of Biden overreaching yet again while he continues to ignore issues that really should demand his attention. 
I will continue to work with Attorney General La uh, Lawrence Wozden to vigorously uphold state sovereignty and defend Idaho's laws in the face of federal meddling. Well, speaking of Lawrence Wozden, our outgoing Attorney General, contrary to the carefully edited assertion in paragraph 25 of the department's complaint that Idaho's laws are preempted, EMTALA actually states, Wozden says, the provisions of this section do not preempt any state or local law requirement, except to the extent that the requirements directly conflicts with the requirement of this section. So they're saying basically there shouldn't be any sort of confliction there. Wazza went on to call out the DOJ for not sitting down with the state of Idaho to work something out before filing this lawsuit to discuss the interplay between our abortion laws and EMTALA, he said, calling the lawsuit politically motivated. Instead of attempting to engage Idaho in a meaningful dialogue on this issue, the federal government has chosen to waste taxpayer money on an unnecessary lawsuit, he said. However, on page 11 of the 17-page lawsuit, it'd be paragraph 41, the DOJ claims to have sent a letter to the state of Idaho on July 29th, that'd be last Friday, expressing the view that Idaho's law was contrary to federal law and, quote, the United States did not receive a substantive response. So I, I have that letter right here, which arrived at the AG's office, well, it'd be last Friday in the Capitol building, Friday afternoon, mid-afternoon sometime. And it says at the very end, should you wish to identify facts or issues relevant to whether the United States should file an action, please do so no later than August 1st, 2022. They gave Idaho three days, 72 hours to respond basically to something the U.S. attorney had six weeks to put together. Not enough time in Idaho's AG opinion. However, about a month ago, we did get a glimpse of where the Biden administration might go with this when President Biden signed an executive order safeguarding access to reproductive care services, which mentioned protections granted under EMTALA. And St. Luke's, which just happens to be one of Idaho's 43 hospitals participating in Medicare, and they're one of the 39 with emergency departments subject to EMTALA standards. And they shared with us a memo they received in September of last year, of 2021, from the Department of Health and Human Services, reiterating and reinforcing the EMTALA obligations for those who are pregnant or dealing with a loss of pregnancy. Quote, the determination of an emergency medical condition is the responsibility of the examining physician or other qualified medical personnel. And those treatments are also under the purview of the doctor or other qualified medical personnel, which, according to this memo, could include abortion. So they've been talking about this and planning for it for quite some time. So what does this all mean? Well, like it was predicted by Idaho's attorney general for the last three legislative sessions, Idaho's abortion laws will be challenged in court because of their constitutionality. And it's going to cost Idahoans a chunk of change and do so. We don't know yet when this federal lawsuit will see a courtroom. However, we do know at least two of Idaho's recent abortion laws will see the inside of the state Supreme Court with their lawsuits being heard tomorrow morning. We're just weeks away from the trigger law going into effect, criminalizing abortion in Idaho. Planned Parenthood filed two lawsuits, one against that trigger law and the other against the Texas-style fetal heartbeat bill that would make abortion illegal after six weeks of pregnancy. Tomorrow, Idaho's Supreme Court's going to hear arguments from Planned Parenthood attorneys about why the new abortion laws are illegal. And they're also going to hear arguments from the state and legislative lawyers of why they are not. Interesting the nuance here. Idaho lawmakers are going to have essentially two legal teams representing them tomorrow. Why? Because they can. Joe Paris spoke with legislative leaders about why they do want these private legal resources. This also takes a look at how the AG's office is going to work alongside another legal team. Wednesday marks a major day in the battle over Idaho's new abortion laws. The Idaho Supreme Court will hear from Planned Parenthood and the state of Idaho via the Attorney General's office on why they believe the new law should or should not go into effect. The Idaho legislature is also a part of the lawsuit. They filed to intervene so that they can get their arguments into court. Well, I think, you know, the main thing is, is we felt like in a separation of powers issue that the legislature uh, passes the law. We want to make sure that we are represented and therefore we intervene. Senate pro tem Republican Senator Chuck Winder says lawmakers joined the suit to argue that the legislature acted legally by passing the abortion laws and that they should be allowed to take effect. Lawmakers believed in intervening because they weren't named in the suit as a respondent and wanted to make sure they were represented. It is up to the states to uh, make their own laws and as long as those laws are reasonable, uh, they should be uh, upheld. We're hoping that uh, they'll remove their stay on the uh, trigger law and uh, 
So they also are bringing the heartbeat bill into it as a recent case. So we're hopeful that they would uh, remove any stays on that. Private attorneys for the legislature will essentially work alongside the AG's office as they make arguments on Wednesday. Idaho lawmakers actually passed a law that allows the legislature to intervene in cases that challenge laws that they passed with their own counsel if they don't want to work with the AG or they believe there's a conflict of interest or a reason to hire outside counsel. Winder explains how the AG and private counsel are looking at this case. There's a little different approach at how they've approached the case and their arguments that they've made, uh, but I really think we have both uh, the same goal, and that is to uh, get this law in place, to re get the stays removed, and to uh, move forward uh, based upon uh, what the Supreme Court decision was, that it's really up to the states to establish what their uh, abortion laws are going to be in each of the states. Idahoans are asking if their tax dollars will go to both the AG's defense team and the private counsel of the legislature. The answer, yes. One, one is being paid out of the executive side and one's being paid out of the legislature side. So again, it's a balance of power issue that uh, was provided for in the Constitution and we felt that the legislature uh, should have adequate representation uh, to intervene and to be part of this process. Senator Winder adds the private counsel the legislature hired can bring a different perspective to their side. These are very specialized cases and so we went out and tried to find the uh, best uh, attorneys we could to represent the people of Idaho on behalf of the legislature. So what will the court hear arguments on tomorrow? Three main questions. Should the court put both abortion laws in question on hold while the cases are pending? Should the two cases be consolidated into one? And should either or both of the cases be transferred down to the district court level for trial before being taken up by a high court? The first two will be heavily debated in court Wednesday. That third question, though, about venue seems to have agreements from all sides. Here's Winder's view. You know, the Supreme Court, I think, is the uh, proper court of jurisdiction in this case. Uh, I don't think that it should be reprimanded to a district court. Uh, I think the Supreme Court needs to make a decision and... Uh, and move forward. So how much will this cost Idahoans having two legal teams take on Planned Parenthood's challenge to the laws? Well, we don't know the exact numbers, still a lot of hours to log, but our partners at the Idaho Press and reporter Betsy Russell says that the two attorneys that are the private attorneys for the legislature, they are going to be charging the state at $375 an hour plus expenses. Now, the legislature does have a little more than $3 million in the bank as a part of their legal defense fund, so that will likely cover this set of cases. But, Brian, there's a lot of cases out there. There's a lot of questions out there. There's also a third pending uh, case that we could find out more info about tomorrow, the third law that yep. Idaho passed most recently that's also been challenged in court by Planned Parenthood. We're not sure that's going to get taken up tomorrow. From what we understand, it'll just be the first two laws that were passed in 2020 and 2021. We're going to dive into all of this tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. Tomorrow, the Idaho Supreme Court is going to hear an hour of arguments, 30 minutes from each side. We'll see how close we stay to the 30 minutes on each side, but we'll have a full recap here on the 208 tomorrow. We're going to be talking with some of the major players involved, but as we head into tomorrow, and I know this is probably interesting to viewers at home. There's a lot of unknown still, but tomorrow at this time, five o'clock tomorrow, we'll have a pretty clear picture on where the state of Idaho could be going with the abortion laws. Okay, so just while I have you here and just Alex Duggan has done a very good job writing this up for KTV.com. But just so we're clear, as you mentioned, there's two laws. 2020, the trigger law was passed. 2021, the Texas style heartbeat fetal heartbeat ban was passed that eliminated abortions after six weeks. Then there was the amendment passed last year that put in the fact that families could sue Right. Anybody who provided or helped provide an abortion to right. a woman. So we don't know about that one tomorrow, but we do know about the others two. And Senator Winder said that we are two stays in place on those first two laws. So they cannot be enforced until they figure that out, which could happen tomorrow. Right. And then after that, we have this DOJ lawsuit that if the state Supreme Court says these are all good to go, let them go through. The DOJ could say, well, hold on one second. Just so I have that clear, is that yeah. right? It, it could get sticky here if the state Supreme Court says one thing and the federal government comes in and they say another thing. Now, there is a supremacy clause yep. where, in, in theory, the federal law is supposed to take you know, precedent. But we'll see. This is going to get very messy. Um, the truth is that we're at an intersection of politics and, and legalese in terms of the federal case against the state. We'll have to wait and watch, though. And the DOJ is saying, no, you couldn't. It's not that you can't ban abortion. You just can't say, well, you can't receive medical attention because yeah. somebody's health is in question.
not necessarily life. All right, yeah, a lot of elements there. Thank you very much, Joe. All right, so about an hour ago, senators in D.C., Washington, D.C., were meeting to vote on this PACT Act for the third time. It was a bill that's going to help more than 3.5 million veterans who have been exposed to toxic chemicals while working near burn pits or getting exposed to toxic chemicals like Agent Orange during Vietnam, all this kind of stuff. And they wouldn't have to jump through so many hoops to get these benefits. So this is kind of what happened. We talked about this earlier. Our entire delegation said no to this previously, but it was back on the Senate floor today to talk about it and kind of go through it. There were a couple amendments that were passed through or failed to pass through. So basically what happened is they were voting again on the original bill that included this $400 billion worth of mandatory spending that had to do with veterans. Democrats claim Republicans didn't care about the veterans. Idaho senators voted against it. All our delegation voted against it. Today, well, they did it again. Both Senators Crapo and Risch voted against the PACT Act, but it did pass the Senate. So now we know it does go to the desk of the president. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky proposing all these kind of things that didn't pass, including cutting stuff that would say other countries are going to help pay for the PACT Act. It's all kind of confusing. We kind of were keeping tabs of it while it was happening, but Republican Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, his proposal that would make the mandatory discretionary, that failed as well. So here we are, 60 votes were needed. They got 48. It failed the amendment. Crapo and Risch voted against it. Or yes, excuse me, Senators Crapo and Risch both voted yes on the amendment. Am I hearing that correctly? Because this happened just moments ago, right? No, against it, third time. It looks like it's going to pass, though, to get that 60 votes. We'll sort it all out. We'll be right back. It's a name you might know if you've been to Boise County's Idaho City. More than a century and a half after he was one of the first to find gold in the Boise Basin, the Grimes name lives on, even if he didn't live long after. This is your call out to reach out to the 208. All you got to do is send us a text. 208-321-5614. That's the number. Include your comments, your complaints, even your questions. But also include your name and the hashtag the 208. And if it's clever, clean, and concise, well, we might even share it at the end of the show. You know, one would think to listen to all the talk these days, a mass influx of outsiders from places like California and other states into Idaho, you'd think that was a new thing. Well, it was a thing before even Idaho was a thing. It might be obvious for most since, of course, only the native Nez Perce can truly lay claim to being real Idahoans. But what drove the first wave of pioneers and outsiders into early Idaho? Well, the desire for gold, of course, and it all began in an area that was pegged to become the next big city on this day in 1862. There was a time when Idaho City was the largest town between St. Louis and San Francisco, thanks to the discovery of gold in the Boise Basin in the 1860s. The story goes that discovery and the incoming prospector population can be attributed to two men. George Grimes and Moses Splawn made their way to the Boise Mountains in the summer of 1862. And just days after arriving, on August 2nd, Grimes and Splawn struck gold. It was a newfound fortune cut short. 
at least for George Grimes, because apparently that gold was found on the hunting grounds of the Bannock tribe, and they weren't exactly thrilled about the prospect of more prospectors invading their land. So they attacked the Grimes party, killing George. Splawn explained the story to a local paper about facing what seemed like 20 guns fired in their faces at the top of a hill. He said Grimes fell just as they reached the top. His last words were, Moe's, don't let them scalp me, and thus perished a brave and honorable man at the time when he stood ready to reap his reward. We carried him to a prospect hole and buried him amid silence. And together, they worried whose turn would be next. Buried in that unmarked grave, a creek, a mountain pass, and the surrounding area memorably bear the name of George Grimes. Unmarked grave no more, by the way. It was unmarked for more than 60 years. Then in 1923, Dr. Francis Thompson, the Dean of Mines at the University of Idaho, he worked to add a grave marker for George Grimes. It's unknown who did pay for it, but according to an article published in 1923, Dr. Thompson suggested it be paid for by the Idaho State Historical Society or another state agency. The grave, George Grimes' grave, by the way, can still be found in what's now the Grimes Pass Cemetery, which is near Idaho City.
All right, lots of comments on this DOJ lawsuit against Idaho. Let's get right to your comments. I can't imagine why the federal government at taxpayer expense sued Idaho rather than Texas is a reflection of the big city polit politicians' view of us. Well, no, what I gathered from the press conference was that Idaho's law hasn't gone into effect yet. Therefore, they have a chance of kind of putting it, stopping it, as opposed to reversing it, like with the Texas law already in play. Ever heard of MYOB? Mind your own business. If you don't like abortion, don't have one. Unless you're opening your checkbook to pay to raise these babies from birth to college graduation, mind your own business. Bonus points if you're a white man minding your own business. Once again, in the Idaho GOP legislature will spend millions to shove bad legislation that constituency did not ask for. Legislature legal fund only ensures extremist ideas will be entertained with no thought of the Constitution or the people that vote for him, says Chuck. Governor Little's statement regarding the DOG lawsuit against Idaho illustrates his view that a woman's right to her own body is not worthy of his time, says Christine. Brian, my husband died from exposure to Agent Orange 27 years ago. His doctor wrote his death was a direct result of it, but without the acknowledgement of our federal government, my children have yet to receive benefits. Just a reminder, 11 senators voted against the PACT Act. Two of those senators came from Idaho. We'll see you back here tomorrow.